Hey everyone, my name is Katie and welcome back to my channel. I'm actually doing a wrap up on time. I don't know who she is because the last two times I've done wrap ups, they were like a month late and now I'm actually getting it out when it should be up. That's amazing because that is not <laughs> what the trend has been for me lately. So if you saw my June TBR, you'd have seen I had a bunch of amazing books that I had on deck to read in June. I read zero of them. I did not read a single one. I pretty much like continued on my May TBR and I was like, oh, I'll catch up to my June TBR eventually. Nope, didn't happen. Some months you stick to the TBR, some months you completely don't. So here's my all off TBR wrap up. First up, I read A Study in Charlotte by Brittany Cavallero, which was a buddy read with my friend Angela over at Blonde Books. And I actually read this one on the train on the way to BookCon. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's a modern day Sherlock Holmes with a twist. Jamie Watson and Charlotte Holmes are descended from the original Holmes and Watson, and they somehow wind up at the same private school in Connecticut. Due to their famous relatives, Charlotte wants absolutely nothing to do with Jamie, but Jamie sort of hero worships Charlotte as he's grown up his whole life hearing about the Holmes family. When a murderer starts murdering students at their private school and is framing Watson and Holmes, they must come together to solve the mystery and clear their names, otherwise they could be facing some serious trouble. I gave this one four out of five stars. It was actually a lot grittier than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be just like, oh, like a cutesy little retelling, but it actually has a lot of more grown up themes like Charlotte is a drug addict and Jamie has anger issues and it had just some dark connotations in terms of like the murders and all this stuff. So. That was not something that I was expecting to be addressed in this book, but I thought that it was kind of cool having these characters go through these struggles because it's like very real life gritty stuff that they go through. It's kind of cool when something is a retelling, you obviously want to put a spin on the source material, but also like not take it too far away from the source material that people are like, well, this doesn't relate at all. So it's cool that Jamie and Charlotte are descended from the original Watson and Holmes and that they kind of grow up their whole lives knowing about them and that Watson actually chronicled his adventures with Sherlock and wrote the books and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was their literary agent so that's like a cool spin on it and these characters were pretty modeled after their ancestors in the original Watson and Holmes but I didn't find that too much of a detractor because it is a retelling kind of so I don't think that they should be too different but they also had enough unique personalities that set them apart and it's definitely a very character driven story which is not something i was expecting in a mystery just because we have jamie's first person perspective is what the story is told from so we get to see charlotte from how jamie views her and it's kind of very like a personal story to jamie and not told from like this third person where we're seeing kind of both their perspectives we are very biased towards what jamie is experiencing and how he views charlotte kind of affects our view of her as a character whereas like objectively she may read a lot differently because she has all of these issues <laughs> next i read a lesson in thorns by sierra simone on my kindle and i picked this one up because i saw mail to the any head reviewed it on goodreads and this is basically like a smut book and we follow poe who is a librarian and she goes back to thorn chapel manor which is where she would play as children with these five other kids and they're reunited as adults and the manor is very atmospheric and you know stuff goes down <laughs> i kind of like to think of it as like a grown-up raven cycle it's kind of like the vibe that i was getting I ended up giving this one 5 out of 5 stars. It was probably the most intense smut book I've ever read. There were a lot of things in here. It was like BDSM, polyamory. Every character was bisexual, so it was just very different because usually the usually the smut books I've been reading up until now was just like male-female. So, very interesting. The characters are also very complex and they have their own dynamic between them all and the fact that it's surrounded by this mystery of this atmospheric English manner and kind of like rooted in old pagan traditions and all that stuff, it, that's kind of where I got the Raven Cycle vibes from and it definitely adds a layer to the plot. It's not just like smut plot but it has like another layer to it that's bringing all these characters together and making them act the way that they do. Next, I listened to Again But Better by Christine Ruscio on audio. Shane's have been doing college all wrong. She's pre-med with stellar grades and happy parents, but she's not happy herself. So when the opportunity comes to study abroad in London, Shane decides that she's going to go for it and do college the way that she wants to. 
However, when self-doubt starts to creep in, everything starts to fall apart. So there are two parts in this book and there is a twist in the middle that kind of changes the, the rules of how everything works. And I found part one was a three star read for me and part two was a four star read for me. So overall I gave it a 3.5 stars. Part one did drag a lot for me and I just think it might be that I'm not in college anymore or this wasn't my college experience, but uh, I don't know. I just felt like some of it was just like over the top where Shane was like very awkward and it just made me get secondhand embarrassment and I am myself awkward sometimes but I still like I don't know just like kind of made me feel embarrassed while I was reading it. I like got very frustrated with her character at some point but I also think that is again because of where I am in life where I kind of have everything figured out whereas I'm not a teenager that like is really kind of like lost in the college experience. So if that is like maybe what you're experiencing you could relate to her more but I just wasn't relating to her on that level but I acknowledge that that's like my own personal experience my own personal bias and I hated Shane's parents they were so freaking pushy and like when you go away to college you're on your own and you're kind of there to make decisions for yourself and the fact that her parents were so controlling really bothered me and I know that's kind of like the point of the story is her dealing with these pushy parents but like I just didn't like it and I didn't feel like in the end they were redeemed enough for the way that they treated her during her college experience and during her time like I just didn't find them redeemable in the end and I just didn't like their behavior at all like, I don't think that's how parents should be acting towards their child so in part two of the book is when Shane starts to make decisions for herself and starts to grow as a person and this is when I found her a little bit more relatable and that just a little bit more bearable to me because you see her finally like overcoming all these things that other people are telling her and she's going out and she's making these decisions for herself and not for anyone else and that's when I started being like okay like I like this book more and the love interest pilot like he was okay like I didn't feel anything like super like oh like he's great or oh he sucks like he was just okay but in the end I did like kind of like coming away with the message that you should follow your dreams regardless and not do something just because other people are telling you that's what you should do and I will just like say some commentary and some reviews I saw that people were saying like oh this book feels very personal to Christine semi-autobiographical by, by <laughs> I can't say the word semi-autobiographical biographical no I I'm just gonna avoid saying that for now on because I don't think I'm saying it right. I like do agree that if you watch Christine's channel, you can see a lot of her personality injected into the book and injected into Shane, especially in a lot of her experiences. And I do think that this is based on her real life experiences, but I don't think it's fair to like completely judge a book on that because I'm sure that is the way for lots and lots of books where authors put all these pieces of themselves into it but we just don't see that because we don't know them as a person. So I think it's hard to judge on that just because Christine has this very popular platform and everyone knows her personality. That's why we as readers are able to see those pieces of her in the book whereas another author may have done the exact same thing but we just don't know them on the personal level because they're not you know like an influencer and a creator and we don't see where those autobiographical <laughs> we don't see where those pieces of themselves come in to play and i feel like it, it's kind of cool to have personal touches from the author and being able to notice that their personal touches is kind of cool because i felt like i was able to see more of her personality through the writing and in general i thought the writing was pretty solid like it's a solidly written book there's nothing like horrible about the writing and it's pretty easy to read through i think my problems with the book or the things i didn't necessarily like were all like based on the characters but the writing itself and the execution of it was completely fine next up is fury born by clara legrand and if you know me you know that this was one of my favorite books of 2018 and during this reread it still remains one of my favorite books and during my reread I was able to tab it properly so I have all these beautiful tabs and I love this book. It's like the fantasy book of my dream and stay along and hear why I love it so freaking much. There is a prophecy that two queens will rise, one of blood and one of sun. They will carry the power of all seven elements and they have the ability to save the world or to doom it. When Riel Darden is exposed as having all seven elemental powers, she must undergo 
trials in each of the elements to prove that she is the sun queen and not the dreaded blood queen. A thousand years later, the tale of Queen Riel is that, just a tale to Eliana Farakora. She is a bounty hunter for the Undying Empire and does what she must to help her family get by. But when her mother is taken captive, she realizes she is not as untouchable to the Empire as she thought she was. And now she must join a rebel captain on a mission to find her mother. And as they both fight in a cosmic war that spans millennia, their story intersects in ways that just might shock you. Okay, five out of five stars obviously. <laughs> what is so cool about this book is that the stories take place a thousand years apart and we follow both Riel and Eliana. It has the most intense prologue ever. Just right off the bat you're like what the heck is happening? This is so intense and it's kind of one of those stories that tells you the end at the very beginning and so you're so intrigued to see how you get from where you start in chapter one to how you end up at the prologue. I don't know, I just think this book is so masterfully crafted and my opinion has only increased ever since I read Kingsbane, which I will talk about later. I just like love the juxtaposition of Eliana and Riel's stories. It's kind of like their arcs are anti-parallel where they're going in different directions where one is like a hero arc and the other is a villain arc. And you can read it to find out who is who. Both of them are angry, power powerful girls and they don't want it to be held to the standards that society holds them to be or put in the roles that they're kind of forced into. And they definitely don't always make the best decisions, but yet we still want to root for them. And they are definitely really complex and they're kind of, and I think that they bring another layer to the typical female heroine in fantasy just because they are impulsive and rash and just, I don't know, they're just something different about them both. The world of Avitas, which is where this takes place, is just so imaginative and unique and I, the big villains of the stories are angels, so usually angels are seen as like these heavenly creatures that are full of goodness and light, and in this story they are full out just evil. <laughs> so it's kind of cool seeing how something that is typically known as a good thing being turned into the villain of the story. And don't get me started on Corian because he's just like the dark, sexy villain that we all love. And when he is in the scene, the way that he manipulates the girls is just like so intriguing and you really see them struggle with his influence, which is cool. I am not always a fan of flipping perspectives and dual perspective fantasies just because I find if one storyline is stronger than the other and then I struggle, I'm like, I don't really wanna read this character's chapters, like I wanna go to the next one, but this one kept me hooked because the stories are pretty much completely separate for the most part. So like something would happen in Rail's chapters and I'd be like, oh my God, I wanna know what happens next in Rail's storyline, but then you go to Eliana's chapters and I'm like, oh my God, Yes, I remember, I wanted to know what happened here and I just kept going and going because I wanted to know what was happening to each of the girls and what was going on in their stories and it just kept me hooked the entire time and the fact that we have these two separate storylines that could probably be fantasy novels on their own and they're both going on in the same universe but a thousand years apart, like it's just so cool. Like the time jump aspect is something that can be tricky if it's not done well and I thought it was done so well and it's just executed like chef's kiss flawlessly. I could literally go on like a gigantic rant, but I'm just gonna stop there because I have more things to say about Kings Bay. <laughs> Next, I read the novella Shadow Me by Trotta Moffey, which takes place between Restore Me and Defy Me, and I don't really have much to say here, except it's kind of cool getting a little bit of extra, and we finally get a novella from Kenji's perspective, and Kenji's like the really funny sidekick character, and so he's just like fun, he's a good time. It was a pretty quick read, 77 pages, and that kind of, you know, tides you over until Defy Me, which I haven't read yet, which I need to get to eventually. Next up was another smutty read, and that is Fix Her Up by Tessa Bailey, and don't let the cute cover fool you because this book is dirty. <laughs> Travis Ford is an MLB player until an injury ends his successful career, and he winds up back in his hometown on his ass. Georgie Castle has always had a crush on her older brother's best friend, but after his injury, he's far grumpier than she remembers. However, a moody scowl doesn't scare her away, and Georgie is determined to show Travis that he is more than just his baseball career. And when Georgie needs to be taken seriously by her family, she decides the best way to do that is to convince Travis to be her fake boyfriend. Good old fake dating trope. So I give it one five out of five stars. Um, I think with smut, you just kind of have to realize that sometimes it's going to be very cheesy. And I mean, Georgie's 
career is that she is a birthday party clown. So, you know, you just take it with a grain of salt. What's cool about this book is it takes place in Port Jefferson, Long Island, which is, I'm from Long Island, I'm not from there, but it's an area that I'm familiar with. So when they were talking about the town, I was like, oh, I've been there. I actually went there to play Pokemon Go because there's like a lot of Pokemon there back in like the height of Pokemon Go. The dirty talk in this book was on another level. I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm just gonna leave it there. I really liked the relationship. I thought it was super cute and I feel like the characters brought out the best in one another, which is what I always like to see in my romances because you just want them to be cute and happy and in love, but also enrich each other's lives. And I thought that there was some good talk on female empowerment in the book as well and not like having girl and girl hate, all that stuff. So I appreciated that discussion. I'm also like, I don't think that I rate smut books as critically as I rate regular books. Like I'm not gonna compare a smut book to like a fantasy novel. So for the most part, my ratings are basically based on pure enjoyment and not like, is this like the best sex scene ever written? Because you know, it, it is what it is. Next up, I read Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuinston while I was on the beach and it was the perfect beach summer read. And I recently featured it in my video, top five books read by the pool this summer. So check that out. For son of the United States, Alex Claremont Diaz has a sworn enemy and that is His Royal Highness Prince Henry of Wales. However, when an unfortunate incident at the royal wedding causes international scandal, Henry and Alex must put their differences aside and fake a friendship for the press. However, what first begins as a fake friendship grows to be something much deeper. Five out of five stars. I mean, this book was so cute. So cute and also so important. I just love the romance between Henry and Alex. I love them. They must be protected at all costs. This book was obviously very well researched. Casey McQuinston was a journalism major and that definitely shows in the writing. It's just so well researched in terms of how tabloids work but also well researched in terms of international relations and the politics and I can't say I necessarily like thinking about our political state but I feel like I got to learn a little bit more about how politics work and international relations through a fun cute story that lended itself the plot but you know you came away learning something a little bit more. I also thought that this was a really good exploration of sexuality and race because Alex is both bisexual and biracial and it was cool having a first family where the president was a divorced mother with a biracial family and that's just so different from today's political landscape and I just wish that Ellen Claremont was our president. And this book was hilarious. There were so many moments that I was actually like crying laughing because it was so funny like Henry and Alex together they just make these wisecrack jokes and they're just hilarious and I just love this book I'm giving this book all the love it was just everything that people are hyping it up to be it is that it's amazing it is more on the new adult side although I wouldn't say it's like anything like super smutty all of the scenes are fade to black and they're not like very explicit if that is something that you are worried about going into it um but still like enough steam that it is definitely not considered YA. And with that being said, I must have just been on some like presidential kick because I read American Queen by Sierra Simone, which is the same author as Lesson in Thorns. And after really enjoying Lesson in Thorns, I wanted to check out some of her other work. So this one follows Greer Galloway, who is the granddaughter of the vice president and runs in all these circles of high powered political people. And she's basically drawn into a romance with the president of the United States, who at the age of 36 is a really young president and in the beginning of the book we find out that she's getting married to him and basically what you find out is that Greer is in love with both the president and the vice president and the president and the vice president are in love with each other so it is a polyamory bdsm book again that seems to be a common theme with sierra simone's works maybe this wasn't the best one to read right after red white royal blue where the plot politics are very well thought out and very realistic because this was just so unrealistic like just so unrealistic but it was fun um there were some things that i maybe had a little bit of a problem with but they weren't anything that took away from my enjoyment i mean it was just like a fun smutty beach read i gave it 3.5 out of 5 stars it's definitely different and it's cool that her books showcase different sexualities and things like that the only thing is i didn't feel as connected with the story or with the characters as i did with listen in thorns and also just ended on the most ridiculous cliffhanger where i was just like why was that necessary i don't know i don't know then i read the goal by l kennedy and i've been loving the off-campus series but this one did not do it for me 
at all. We follow Sabrina James, who comes from a rough area of town, and she's worked her butt off to get where she is at Briar University and on her way heading to law school. However, a sizzling encounter with John Tucker might just re derail all of her carefully lead plans. And give it two out of five stars. It just has the pregnancy trope which I don't like, I don't really want to read about, but I read it because I've been loving this series so far. And just like, didn't do it for me. Like, Tuck is obviously very sweet, and I think the way that he handled the whole situation, like, you know, was nice. And, you know, I admire him for it. And the way that Sabrina, Sabrina was just like so closed off at some points where I was just like, all right, like, come on, like, get over yourself a little bit. Like, hello, we gotta, we gotta do things here. and. It was just frustrating at some points, and um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's just pregnancy trope, not for me. Also, like, I don't want to spoil anything, but the way that she got pregnant just was a little bit scientifically impossible. So that just had me scratching my head a little bit because I was like, mm, I don't think that can happen, or the odds are like point zero 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 one percent. So. Um, just seemed just seemed a little weird. Just a little weird. I mean, like it was cute, and the message at the end is that you can still be a mother and accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in life, and that like having a baby doesn't stop you from following your dreams. That was nice, but like that really wasn't what I was looking for in this series. Like I'm looking for like college age romance, and mm, 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 not my thing. But I am continuing on with the spinoff series because that spinoff series does not have any pregnancy tropes, so I'm back to enjoying them. Uh, and to finish off the month, I read King's Game by Claire Legrand, which, oh my god, this series got even better than it was. You know I love Fury Born, I just talked about it, but King's Bane brought it up another notch. My love for this series is undying, like the undying empire. Like, oh my god. My, my mind is constantly blown by this. It's so unique and inventive and captivating, and I just love it. And I think it's funny that I love it so much because some people like completely hated the first book, but you know, I loved it. I'm trashed for it. And that's that. This was the fantasy book of my dreams, basically. I will say, I think that this book is more on the new adult side. It's definitely not YA fantasy just because there is some explicit content in here, which like, I'm here for, but like if you're younger, that may not be your thing. So just be aware. I do think that there is a market for a new adult fantasy and we need more of it and it's not like it's a new adult fantasy where it's just like smut with a fantasy setting it's just fantasy where there happens to be women that are like in their 20s and the like love interest scenes are more intense i will maybe cry during a book if i'm like a little bit sad but it takes it takes a lot for me to cry i've never cried from being shocked like i was so shocked by the ending of this book i literally was just like what just happened and like my eyes tears started welling up and like i don't cry like why am i crying but i'm just so emotionally attached to this series and then claire legrand she went there and it just it changes everything and there's a lot of um timey-wimey stuff in this book because we get to learn a little bit more about how like time is spent and the different timelines and stuff like that and that can be so so tricky but i think she kind of said sets it forward in a way that's pretty straightforward so you can kind of like get it like okay this is how like time stuff is gonna work timeline stuff is gonna work in here it's not super confusing it made sense to me and like my mind is blown basically we again are following Riel's and Eliana's stories and we get just like even more perspectives and they just add in layers to the story and I have so many theories about like things I need to know that that is what is what is happening <sighs> And I, just the plot twist that shocked me, I think it was the perfect plot twist because looking back there were such little hints but you wouldn't think that it would lead up to what it did and then it did and you're like, I did not see that coming in a million years but it makes so much sense looking back and you're just like, this is this is how I'm feeling right now. Like I just, I'm not over it, I'm not over it. And of course the story is naturally crafted, like the world building is just sweeping and the layers and layers of mythology and the way that the magic works, like it's very well defined and it adds as the story goes along and we discover more as the characters, we discover more, like it's not really confusing but we get more of it as we move forward and we get to see how the magic works and just like, mm, it's cool. My darling characters, I love them. I love them so much and I love Riel and Eliana, like they do not make good decisions at this point but yet I still like am rooting for them and just seeing how 
calling back to the prologue, we know kind of where this story ends up, but just like you don't want it to go there and like you just see it happening and you're like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And kind of like we get to see Riel becoming more of the villain that she's like known to have been in, in Eliana's time and we get to see Eliana kind of like she, you know she used to be a bounty hunter like she wasn't a good person and she's kind of like discovering that she doesn't have to be that way and like who she is as a person when she's not forced to be in this role by this empire and like mm, it's it's just really good it's just really good and there are narrative voices even though they're similar their narrative voices are very different there's different emotional turmoil where they go through to kind of lead them to where they are and where their characters develop to and just like Oh my god and then just like no one is what you think they are here like i'm constantly guessing the character's motives like i just don't know and like how is it all gonna end up because even though we have that prologue like is that really how things are gonna end like i i don't know i don't know i think the two things i love about this series that really are what puts it at the top of my favorites list is i'm constantly on my toes i'm constantly guessing what's gonna happen and also the characters are just so distinct that I'm really drawn to them and I'm especially drawn to both Riel and Eliana because they're difficult women making difficult choices not always making the right choices and yet you just like feel for them and you relate to them and it just shows that like they're not bland like they're angry and they have these emotions and they feel things it's just good it's just good I'm not I'm not over it I'm not over it like when is Fury Born 3 coming out what is the title going to be what color is it going to be? What's the cover gonna look like? I need to know. I need to know. So, um, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed and now you know why. Now you know why. And that was the last book that I read in June. So that was basically kind of like finishing up my May TBR. <laughs> you know, I didn't stick to my TBR. It's fine. I was busy. I was traveling a lot. I went to BookCon. I went to the Dominican Republic. I went to Florida. So, you know, you know, don't always have time to stick to TBRs, but like, I just love that I got this experience with Furyborn and like my beach reads were fun. Like, I, I don't know, I had a good month. I pretty much liked everything that I read and then I obviously really loved some. So let me know if you've read any of these books down below and what your favorite June read was. And in the meantime, have some fun, read some books and I'll catch you guys in the next one.